to live and think like pigs. The incitement of envy and boredom in market democracies by Gil Chatelet. Chapter 2. Chaos as Imposture. Self-regulation as Festive Neoconservatism. Superstition always requires its devil, who exudes mischief and excuses one from facing the fire of the negative, and a prince charming who can awaken virtues with just a kiss. For the first, our epoch has found a figure, radical evil, absolute malice. For the second, chaos. Its counterpart, initially somewhat disquieting, but ultimately rather useful, because it is tricked out with creativity and possesses the virtue of being able to magically fabricate singularity, just as certain plants have a dormative virtue. Chaos would like to present itself as the prince charming who awakens virtualities. But isn't it just a baleful brawl of possibilities, an ab abject copulation of rule and chance? Remember Milton. Chaos umpire sits, and by decision more embroils the fray, by which he reigns, next him, high arbiter, chance governs all. For more than fifteen years now, chaos has had the upper hand. Where exactly does it, its fascination lie? Mathematics and the physical sciences no longer hesitate to venture into this space, which is disputed over by the confused, the obscure, and the disorderly, but also the singular from which new modes of contemplation and action emerge. This cannot leave philosophy indifferent, for better or worse. The temptation is always no longer to conceive of chaos as a blossoming of virtualities, but to accept it as a new natural given, as a competition of possibilities. Sometimes a little hairy, maybe already domesticated, and just precisely disobedient enough to give a frisson to the honest man of the 20th century, the honest humanist who just adores stories of hippopotami whose yawns unleash a cyclone in the northern Baltic. Philosophy seems finally to have been relieved of a problem it had held very dear, that of the riches of darkness, and whose resolution had been sought in cosmologies without creation, which always begin with a chaos of primordial waters, an equivocal mixture of sky and earth, in a state of ontological putrefaction, a state they could never have escaped had not another god decided to separate them. These cosmogonies give us one of the keys to understanding the uneasy fascination that emanate, emanates from chaos. The latter installs thought in a space that one hopes will be fruitful, but which is already gnawed at by the virulent opposition of two principles, Chaos is the unresolved equilibrium of two forces, an equilibrium incapable of assuming the coiled, heightened ambiguity of a couple. It presents itself as a precarious totality within which the possibilities it will supposedly deliver are already confronting each other. This is the whole paradox of chaos. From the start, it is torn apart by the very rivals to which it must give birth. It must resign itself to being nothing but a neutralization, abandoning its fine ambition to deploy a spectrum of virtualities and ending up as a botched dialectic, going no further than the troubled presentiment of a multiplicity haunted by an originary unity, itself already contaminated by the manifold. This is why the fascination exerted by modern scientific theories of chaos is by no means free of equivocation. It brings together two seductions, that of the con of operativity and that of a marveling in the face of all that is just on the verge of appearing. Thus seems to be the dissipated, the whole perplexity that inexorably accompanies the chaotizing, and which Bergson correctly described in Creative Evolution as resulting from a mental oscillation that shuttles between a simple mechanical order and an expressively willed order is precisely this clear distinction between the two orders that allows for the elimination of the equivocation through which disorder lives. Bergson, Bergson shows, firstly, that any theory of knowledge that wishes to be consequent will have to start out by destroying the type of superstition that leads to us m to imagine that there will, could be no order at all. He gives an example, which is crucial, and which functions as a true thought experiment, that of the progressive emergence of chaotizing. First, we think of the physical universe as we know it, with effects of causes, and causes well proportioned to each other. Then, by a series of arbitrary decrees, we augment, diminish, suppress, so as to ob obtain what we call disorder. 
The striking effect of this example owes, of course, to the fact that here the will seems to emerge from the comfort of the order of normal causality to haunt all things. Such a spectacle is all the more disquieting than the pure delivery of a figure of the chaotic. What seems to be placidly domesticated by the laws of physics succumbs to the confrontation between the order of the will and the order of mechanics, or more exactly to the victory of, the capri of caprice over the latter and its subversion by a multitude of elementary wills. In so far as we imagine the appearance and disappearance of phenomena, according to Bergson, only a superior will could bring order to this colony of pulverized wills. Certainly, our own will is there, but it objectifies itself in each of these capricious wills in turn. The dislocation of the order of mechanics calls up the phantom of a will that hesitates between remaining the guardian of unity and dispersing itself into a constellation of elementary volitions while bringing in a mere intention to hover over the latter. What is more, this is what makes Bergson's analysis so remarkable, that he makes us live his example as a thought experiment through which we fall into a vertigo of thought before the disquieting rebellion of will as soon as the impediments of ordinary habits and proportions are thrown off, a rebellion that ruins the order of mechanics and things even as it leaves an intention hovering over them. This experiment also reminds us of the art of great masters of still life of their capacity to insinuate that there is some terrible threat in an um, upturned goblet, in a pile of grapes or apples or grapes, or in a basket hung with game, that the truce of the penance has broken down, that the tidy folds of the tablecloth at the corner of the table will topple into a cataract and join the heavy sacks below the table, that some conspiracy is afoot between the victuals, the candlesticks, and the napkins to allow themselves to be engulfed in a pitiless war of things. Here we find brought to its apex the perplexity that Bergson describes before, before the conflict of these two orders, at once present and absent, before an indetermination not at all grasped as creative, before a masterless proliferating plurality, a perplexity that culminates when the willed order takes its revenge on the dissolving automatic order. This is what happens when one attempts a non-coherent deformation of the laws of physics, one that, one that is not disciplined by robust contemplation. Mechanical necessities, routines, give way to the chaos of scattered, capricious wills. Here we are at the antipodes of the serenity of those thought experiments through which geometers and physicists subtract themselves from the order of causes, without for all that taking refuge in a heaven of intelligibles. To escape the caprice of the order of things calls for the most extreme resolve, and this is why these experiments bring into place situations and liberate gestures that are as incongruous as can be. The, this radical incongruity, obtained through one of the most rigorous disciplines of thought, is a thousand miles from the seductions of the chaotizing that supposedly, like an Aladdin's lamp, generates the most varied forms out of his scattered particularities. What a bonanza for the hard-pressed thinker! Order emerges from chance, or at least allows itself to be snapped up at a bargain price. Thus the great Baroque cauldron of chaotizing succeeds in arcade incarnating the myth of auto-emergence, the myth of an innocent transaction or operation, forgetting that every such operation supposes, implicitly or explicitly, the putting in place uh, of a sometimes very brutal apparatus of equivalence, and an often even crueler distinction between the operator and the operated on, which are not quite so painlessly discernible as butter and buttermilk. Something has to be decided, then. There has to be have been a confrontation, and perhaps struggle, in a symmetry that has been irreversibly broken. Remarkable individuals and ordered structures that seem to be graciously dispensed by an aleatory stew of particular units or pre-given possibilities. Here is something to seduce scientists anxious in the twilight of their life to share with the world their ethical worries and their perspective on knowledge. And above all, of course, something to excite the appetites of economists and politologists always on the lookout for an umbrella of scientific rigor. Let us reassure the reader. It's always the same imposter that goes into the great cauldron, not knowing or feigning ignorance of the fact that the panoply of illustrations borrowed from science, which are supposed to give a bit of backbone to chaotizing thought, aim to mask a crucial dissymmetry in the givens of a problem, whether it is a problem of mathematics, physics, or chemistry, in order to stage the miracle of autoemergence, the election of a remarkable structure on the basis of supposedly perfectly symmetrical or perfectly contingent ingredients, for the honest humanist, always a bit of a sucker for science, 
the effect is generated. How could one not be bowled over by this enigma, the birth of the singular, out of nothing? Hadn't we better catch up? Is it nature more libertarian than we are? Doesn't it offer us a great lesson in democracy? The juggling tartuffles of self-organization ponder gravely, more freshly cynical and less pedantic. Their Victorian counterparts had already delighted in the famous nursery rhyme of the island of goats and dogs. Abandoned on a desert island, a few examples of two species reproduce, leading within a few years to a certain stability in the predatory and herbivorous population. What could be more edifying than this equilibrium emerging from the chaos of teeth and stomachs? There could be no question as to the conclusion. Human society must banish all voluntarism and all interventionism so as, to, as not to disturb the self-organization of the chaos of economic appetites that will sort out those who eat from those who will be eaten. How could one not bow before this? Elect of the invisible! How could anyone refuse to see that modern chemistry and biology, steeped in cybernetics, finally gives the, us the key to the painless scientific management of political sovereignty? The socio-economist von Hayek remarks that the power of the emanating from a particular identifiable individual, a tyrant, soon becomes hateful, and certainly less tolerable than the pressures exerted, exerted by an anonymous and non-localized entity. Public opinion or the market, an entity one is tempted to qualify as ventriloquial, this is why the chaos of opinions of economic supply and demand forces respect. Like all ventriloquial entities with a voice but no face, who speak with their viscera. The sociopolitical mystification of chaos combines two advantages. It is affordable rather than a dangerous thought, and it legitimizes a type of auto-domination, swathed in all the liberatory and baroque glamour of scientific theories, certain of which even claim to have vanquished old-fashioned determinism. We can appreciate the full force of the cretinizing seduction of the chaotizing and of the self-organizing, a massive force like that of miracles, perfectly suited to excite the lusts of economists, of postmodern aesthetes, in short, of all sociopolitical logical researchers, and of every Everything that feeds on the decline of the thinking of the political as such. Like all non-creative metaphors, which we should call second marriage metaphors, chaos, the fractal, and cat uh, catastrophe are content to illustrate and to bring to life a model imported as a turkey solution from mathematical theories, so they can happily dispense with any real thought experiment that might justify the choice of variables and parameters used to articulate pure mathematics with real causalities.